Good afternoon, everybody. I take it that we have representatives from almost every continent in the world, so I'm very glad that you're all here. I'll try to be brief, uh, but I'm very pleased to welcome you to uh, my uh, relatively new university. And when I looked at the program and I, when I looked at your backgrounds, and uh, <clears throat> something that was very striking to me, we believe, some of us believe in a fallacy and it's time maybe to rethink it. We think that the world is flat. And this fallacy in many ways is dangerous because we believe that there are no differences between cultures and people, etc. And what has compounded that is the fact that in many places, including the language of science and technology, English and businesses, English is becoming the lingua franca of the world. So it gives us here in the United States a sense of security. Why do we have to know about the world if the world knows about, uh, you know, is using our language and knows about us? And as a matter of fact, this approach of uh, the Earth is flat or the world is flat has been, I think, very detrimental to uh, uh, the dialogue of civilizations or cultures or even to create a global uh, not only understanding, but a global uh, sensitivity to the differences between people. Now, when I, it, frankly, if the world is flat, Fulbright should not exist. The Fulbright program should not exist. The purpose of the Fulbright pro program is based on this implicit premise that the world is not flat. So you're coming to a place that hopefully is not flat. We believe in what you are doing. We believe in uh, the global dimension. We believe that no university so far has reached a level where it's providing a global education. We believe that we have some proposals and we are doing a certain number of things in terms of a global education that are unique, like the experiential education where our students are spending a year uh, overseas not doing academic tourism, but spending time in another university and then six months in a paid internship. That's only the beginning. We believe also that research, we all think that research is global, but if you look at uh, companies, if you look at what they have done in terms of sourcing research, universities have not been good at thinking about issues like these. And clearly at some point or another, we will have to face this environment. We in higher education, are in a transition mode, and we don't want to believe it. It's, we are going to be in a transition mode at different levels, in terms of education and in, in terms of knowledge creation. So to go back to what you are doing with the Fulbright Scholars and your association, you in many ways could be the ferment of this next thinking about education and about global education more specifically. So that's why I'm delighted to welcome you here. Have you heard of the term intellectual profiling? No. Okay. Essentially, in many countries in the world, there is a hierarchy for the students going into the universities. And essentially, the best students are going where? Where are they going? Well, I didn't hear. Engineering and medical professions. I was talking actually to, Vegas, uh, to some people all across the world about that, you know? I was uh, in the Middle East uh, two months ago, they were mentioning that, I was in other places, and uh, they were mentioning that, and the consequences are essentially the following, that, that, and I'm quoting here. They said the best minds uh, go to science, engineering, medicine, and businesses, you know, the business professions. And in a way, People working on social sciences are viewed as less good and they're attracting less good people. That's what they said, which was very illuminating, very interesting to me. Then they moved on to say the consequences are substantial. The people who ultimately in these countries are going to lead the country have usually a social science background. Therefore, you are not getting the cream of the crop. That's what they said. 
Is it controversial? Yes, it is controversial. Do we need to raise it? Yes. I, as a matter of fact, they asked me to raise it with you. They didn't know I was becoming here, but they asked me to raise this issue in, uh, about high, in higher education, in higher education systems in the United States. Now, what happens in the United States is very interesting. There is no notion of intellectual profiling. As a matter of fact, on average, students change their majors three times, undergraduate students. Is it healthy? Absolutely. Why? Because they come from the best high schools. And they are facing, they have been introduced to 12, 14 disciplines. 16. They come to college, we have 150 majors here. Majors that they haven't known anything about. Ranging from nanomedicine, I mean, to other aspects that you are hearing, for instance, linguistics. So what do students do? They explore and they discover we don't do intellectual profile. That's one aspect. The other aspect is that we are moving to a system of education, and that's what we do here, where we tell the students, if you're interested in a domain, let's say, uh, for instance, engineering, go explore something very different, philosophy economics, religion, whatever it is. Now, why are we doing that? It's what essentially Mr. Lim mentioned. The idea of you know, allowing the students to look at uh, the world from multiple perspectives. So what is worrisome to me is that the social sciences in many countries is treated as a second class operation. If this is the case, there are the consequences that you are seeing today in, in some of these countries are very telling. 